Hello and welcome to the Icons of Music with me, Norman Jay. We feature an artist, maybe from America, maybe from the UK, and uh, give you the background to the artist, play their songs, and play music from associated artists. So, stick with me and listen to the Icons of Music. Icons of Music. Hi and welcome. This week uh, our Icons of Music is a little bit different because we're going to do a feature on the very famous Cavern Club in Liverpool. Welcome to the show. Welcome to Icons of Music with me, Norman Jay. A series of great programmes about the best people in music, the Icons. The Cavern Club opened its doors originally in 1957 as a jazz club. And uh, after that, the following 10 years were just an explosion of music. And, uh, well, it was a great time. The 60s were fantastic and it produced the Beatles. And, of course, it was the time of the Mersey Sound. So lots and lots of groups coming out of Liverpool. It was a guy called Alan Sintner who opened the Cavern Club, having been inspired by the Jazz District in Paris, uh, where there were a number of uh, cellar clubs. Uh, Sintner returned to Liverpool and strove to open a club similar to the Le Cavou de la Huchette in uh, the jazz area. Of Paris, he eventually found a fruit warehouse where people were leasing the cellar. Uh, before this, it was an air raid shelter uh, in the uh, Second World War, and eventually the club was opened on the 16th of January 1957. And the first act to perform there were the Mersey Sippy Jazz Band. Uh, a commercial artist called Tony Booth created the poster artwork for the opening night and that poster became iconic because it was the original poster that introduced the Beatles. Well, what started as a, a jazz club eventually became a hangout for skiffle groups of the area. Uh, skiffle was a crossover between rockabilly and rock and roll, and uh, it was well, it was a period of, of uh, music in the 60s or late 50s that uh, was very interesting because people would put together groups with. Uh, the smallest amount of gear, possibly a guitar, a washboard and uh, a bass drum that would be made out of uh, a tea chest, and a piece of string and a broom handle. The Vipers Skiffle Group uh, that were formed in London were probably one of the most popular uh, groups of their time along with people like Lonnie Donegan and uh, in actual fact the first group that John Lennon was in called the Quarrymen were actually yeah, playing the Skiffle the Vipers Skiffle group as I said were formed in London in 1956 uh, very interestingly though there are people who were associated with this band that went on to bigger things. Uh, Wally White was the original bar manager or coffee manager of the Two Eyes Coffee Bar. Uh, Johnny Martin joined the band, along with Gene van der Bosch, who were both uh, talented singers. Gene van der Bosch was replaced by Freddie Lloyd later in 1958. But amongst the uh, people in the band over a period of time was Tony Tolhurst on bass, John Pilgrim on washboards, uh, there was uh, Mike Pratt and Tommy Hicks, uh, later to be known as Tommy Steele, and uh, later George Martin, who became the Beatles' recording manager at Parlophone and uh, went on to produce for many, many acts for many, many years. Uh, later, Tommy Steele joined the group and also Hank Marvin, yes, Bruce Welsh, Tony Meehan, 
who eventually became the Drifters and then became the Shadows. So we have the Two Eyes Coffee Bar in London and uh, I've done a feature on the Two Eyes Coffee Bar as well so watch out for that one. But we had the Two Eyes Coffee Bar starting its life in 1957 with uh, rock and roll and rockabilly and skiffle and we had the Cavern Club that started its life in 1957 as a jazz club. They were in the north, the Two Eyes was in the south but there's a lot of associations between the two. The Quarrymen formed uh, by uh, John Lennon and already you can hear John's voice even though it's not a very great recording. Anyway, there's a story of how the Quarrymen first got a gig at the Cameron Club. Nigel Wally, who was part of the group, was also a... uh, apprentice golf professional at Lee Park Golf Club and uh, one day he saw Sidner playing golf and uh, asked him if the quarrymen could play at the cavern. Mr Sidner as you remember was the owner of the cavern club and although it was a jazz club it tolerated skiffle. Anyway, the Quarrymen were booked on the 7th of August 1957 to appear between two jazz bands. Before the performance, uh, John Lennon got the guys together and they argued about the set list. After the first song, John got the guys together again on stage and said that we're going to play Don't Be Cruel by Elvis. Rod Davis, one of the members, warned Lennon that the audience would eat you alive, but Lennon ignored this and started playing the song himself, forcing the others to join in. Mr. Sittner pushed his way through the audience and handed Lennon a note which read, Cut out the bloody rock and roll. Icons of music. Icons of music. Sittner sold the club to Ray McFall in 1959. He moved to London and the first blues and beat club was on the 25th of May 1960 and it featured Rory Storm and the Hurricanes and who was the drummer in Rory Storm and the Hurricanes no other than Ringo Starr as we develop the story you'll find out that the Stones play Hi there, the cave cave dwellers. this is Bob Willow saying welcome to the Best of Cello we got the high by high and the lights down low, so here we go with the big three show. The cavern was a very confined space with uh, very low ceilings. It was, well, it, it was what it was. It was a cellar. Uh, it was uh, lively. It was hot and uh, smelly, and uh, you could always smell dental. <laughs> That uh, was Bob Wooler introducing uh, the Big Three. He became the full-time compare and organiser of the lunchtime sessions at the Cavern Club. And the Beatles played their first session on Thursday the 9th of February 1961. Uh, Brian Epstein became involved with the Beatles because uh, somebody wanted one of the records and uh, Brian and his family had a record business and uh, somebody went into the shop one day and asked for a Beatles record. He'd never heard of them. So he found out where they were working, went down to the to the uh, Cavern Club and the rest is history. In the decade that followed Uh, A wide variety of popular acts worked at the Cavern Club, including the Rolling Stones, the Yardbirds, the Hollies, the Kinks, Elton John, Black Sabbath, Queen, The Who, John Lee Hooker, and, funny enough, Petulia Clark, or Petula Clark, I should say. And she had a big hit uh, in 1965 called I Know A Place. 
and I just wonder if it was about the Cavern Club. Scylla started working at the Cavern Club. She was on the door, she was taking the coats, she was a checking girl, I suppose. Uh, she started then doing a little bit of singing with the Beatles on stage, and this was her first big hit. I'd like to sing one of the songs that made this all possible. It's called Anyone Who Had a Heart. No, I dream of you. Anyone Who Had a Heart was released, as I say, in 1964. It became Scylla's first number one and is still the biggest selling single by a British female artist. Now, just before uh, she started work at the Cavern Club, Scylla Black was a singer in a group called King Size Taylor and the Dominoes. They were a Liverpool band that formed in the late 1950s. They played at the Cavern Club. They also played in Germany with the Beatles and many other of the groups. If uh, you're not as old as I am, and uh, I can tell you that uh, in two years I'm going to be 70 years old, uh, which means I've been listening to music since I was about five years old. So I've been listening to nearly a hundred years of mu music because when I started to listen to music, I was listening from the 20s and 30s. But uh, during this period of the 60s, there was a total revolution in music. There was a move from the old school type music. We'd move from, from jazz into uh, uh, what you can call it, um, film music, swing music, you know, the Frank Sinatra days, uh, rockabilly, skiffle, and now we were getting rock and roll. And uh, every every time you turn the radio on, and I mean this, there was something new coming through. Because up to now, we didn't have synthesizers. Uh, we just had uh, guitar, drums, uh, bass, and, uh, and and that was, well obviously trumpets and things, but nothing nothing uh, too technical, nothing too electrical at this particular point in time. So there was a lot to come. The Beach Boys were were different. They were from America. They were from a different culture, but they'd realised that uh, there was something in harmonies, and that sort of sound developed with the development of electronics as we go through the next decade. In April 1960, Gene Vincent was on tour uh, with Eddie Cochran and the songwriter Sharon Sheely. They were involved in a high-speed traffic accident in Chippenham, Wiltshire. Vincent broke his ribs and collarbone. Uh, Cochrane, who was thrown through the vehicle, died a few days later, unfortunately. After the accident, uh, Vincent went back to the United States, but unfortunately his career wasn't going anywhere, so he returned to the UK and actually set up residence here because the tour that he'd been on earlier was so successful. He then went on to tour in Germany uh, with the rest of the guys from the UK. As I say, it was an explosion of, uh, of music at that particular time. He was backed by a group called the Wild Angels and performed at the Royal Albert Hall with Bill Haley and uh, Dwayne Eddy. And everybody says that the guy responsible for rock and roll was... Bill Haley. The Americans were a big uh, influence on young guys in the UK. Uh, we said, you know, the Cavern Club was opened its doors as a jazz uh, venue, which was taken over by the guys that were doing uh, Skiffle and we mentioned the Two Eyes well from the Two Eyes we had the first of the rock and roll acts to come from the UK uh, we had Tommy Steele we had Adam Faith Cliff Richard Marty Wilde etc 
and two guys that uh, became management uh, for these guys impresarios agents whatever you want to call them uh, Jack Good and Larry Palms uh, Larry Palms also visited Liverpool and uh, was interested in taking the Beatles on but unfortunately Brian Epstein got there before him but he did take on another Liverpool act and that was Billy Fury that uh, was Billy Fury who was discovered uh, in Liverpool and uh, one of the first gigs he did was the Cavern Club more on Billy Fury later uh, Liverpool's Cavern Club is the cradle of British pop music impressively, uh, impressively 60 years after its foundation it survives and thrives as a contemporary music venue through seven eventful decades before, during and after the Beatles, this legendary cellar has seen its share of setbacks, yet has played a role in each genre of music. From 1950s jazz to the 21st century indie rock scene. In the 1950s, the history of the Cavern Club begins on Wednesday, the 16th of January, 1957, when the doors opened to this first time famous warehouse in 10 Matthew Street, Liverpool. In the early 1960s, the beat music scene in Liverpool exploded and the Cavern Club became the most publicised pop music venue in the world. Icons of Music, a weekly series. 60s Icons, plus specials every Saturday, with Norman J. Icons of Music.